Tucker made a game-winning shot with one-tenth of a second left on the clock. Tucker swaps it in, hits the Afterwards, the NBA enacted the Trent Tucker rule. According to the rule, when less than three-tenths of a second remain on the game clock, a player can only tip in a pass. If a player catches the pass, sets and shoots, the basket doesn't count. What we want to know, is the rule valid? Or can a player get off a shot fast enough to make the NBA rethink the rule? To find out, we brought in a man who can really knock him down. NBA three-point jam, sharpshooter, Jason Capono. Jason's one of the purest shooters in the league. After years of practice, his three-step technique is second nature. Catch the ball, set the body, and release a deadly accurate shot. The rule is, 0.3 seconds, you can't catch and shoot it, but we think you can. To find out if Jason can work fast enough to be three-tenths of a second, we wire him up with sensors that will precisely measure the time it takes him to catch the pass, set up for the shot, and fire away. I'm going to put this tactile sensor on your middle finger, because that's the finger that will have the ball against it the longest. Are you up to it? Of course. That's what I'm here, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. To assist Jason, we brought along one of the game's rising young stars, NBA point guard Jordan Farmar. He'll handle the inbound pass, and the clock starts the instant Jason's fingertips touch the ball. The number Jason is trying to beat is three-tenths of a second. To put that in perspective, it takes three-tenths of a second to blink our eyes. Can Jason do it? Catch, set, and shoot a basketball in less time than it takes to blink an eye? Sorry, Capono. No go. To catch, set, and shoot took 0.38 seconds. Not nearly fast enough to challenge the Trent Tucker rule. So, Jason, what we're seeing here, this is where you caught the ball, where you see the slight spike in pressure. This is where you reposition your finger on it without even realizing you were doing it, and then your shot is happening with this large spike right there. The sequence breaks down like this. Nine hundredths of a second to catch the ball. And one-tenth of a second to shoot it. The biggest variable in the sequence is his set. It takes Jason a whopping nineteen hundredths of a second to set up for the shot. If you could somehow catch it in the act of shooting so that you don't have to Good actually position. grip the ball, then it's going to be even faster. So what did you just learn over there about... What, what are you going to change? I need to just practice it and, you know, catch the ball and just going straight to my shot rather than trying to catch it and set myself up. Using his normal technique, Jason's deadly accurate, but he'll never be three-tenths of a second. Ball. Jordan. So we bring in college coach Bob Williams. Williams is an expert at shooting technique, and he'll help Jason with the mechanics of a super quick release. He's not going to be working on perfect form. He's working on catch and release and get rid of it as quick as he can. But he has so many years of experience, and his shooting form is so impeccable that his form will still be good no matter how quick he goes. His follow-through, his release will be, be excellent. How coachable is Jason? Can a few brief pointers somehow translate to a release that is quick enough to beat the three-tenths of a second on the clock? Okay, you ready? Here we go. Ready? Three, two, one, go! You see it? You see it? 2-2. Two, two. Jason did it. 
in less time than it takes to blink an eye. He caught a pass, quickly positioned himself, and shot. The readings back it up. When we look at the actual data here, we saw when he did the test, the timer said 0.22 seconds. You see initially there's this small peak as he catches the ball and then adjusts it for the shot. And then as Jason actually takes the shot, it takes about a tenth of a second for that to happen. The total amount of time between the beginning and the end came to 0.22 seconds. He's clearly able to catch and shoot in under three tenths of a second. So, does his blazing fast mark really make a case for changing the NBA's role? Actually, no. In fact, it confirms the rule's validity. Remember, the rule covers situations in which there are less than three-tenths of a second left on the clock. Jason's shot easily beat three-tenths of a second, but he couldn't beat two-tenths of a second. So Jason didn't make a case to change the rule. But his shot makes a case to change the way the NBA measures time. After all, the sports of swimming and track use clocks to measure events in hundreds of a second. Split seconds are vital. It decides who wins and who goes home. It's a chance to go to the finals. It's a chance to win a championship. So it definitely matters. Maybe the rule needs to be changed. With a good it pass is. and a good shot. Change the rule to the Jason Capono rule now. Jason made his case by catching, setting, and shooting a ball faster than it takes to win. We call those results truly eye-opening. Coming up on Sports Science, did the shots that we always miss and batters with curving kicks and curving balls and made in battle. What's the secret to these mind bags? And which breaks more, a pitcher's curveball or a soccer star's free kick? That's next on Sports Science, Tricks of the Trade. In low-scoring games like baseball and soccer, pitches that curve and kicks that swerve can leave your opponent looking and losing. The question is, from 60 feet 6 inches, which curves more? A baseball pitch or a soccer kick? First up, baseball. And taking the sports science mound is college pitcher Adam Jorgensen. Adam's blazing fastball clocks at a major league caliber 95 miles an hour. When you're throwing a fastball and a curveball, what are the things that change in your mechanics? On a fastball, I'm going to come through and it's just going to come right like that. But when I throw a breaking ball, it's going to come through and I'm going to turn it over as I throw it. So how much break can Adam put on the ball? How much did Adam's curveball curve? Our Phantom high-speed camera breaks down the breaking ball. When we superimpose the images of Ryan throwing a fastball and a curveball, we can see that his body position is identical at the moment of release for both pitches. The fastball is released with backspin at a rate of 20 revolutions per second. The curveball's top spin is much faster, 26 revolutions per second. When guys are throwing breaking balls, curveballs, or sliders, what comes through with the palm in, or the palm slightly in, essentially looks like a fastball. Comes out of the fastball arm slot, comes out of the fastball speed with the fastball mechanics. Everything mechanically is, should look the same to the hitter. And seen from another angle, the difference between a fastball and a curveball is astonishing. The curveball immediately starts on a different path. It climbs five inches above the trajectory of the fastball. Just before it reaches home plate, it plummets and crosses home plate eight inches lower than the fastball. That's 13 inches of break. That's Major League stuff. 
In fact, according to scientists who have studied the physics of baseball, the maximum break a pitcher can generate is 17 and a half inches. Although when pitchers like Kerry Wood and Barry Zito throw a curve, batters will swear it's a lot more than that. And then they'll just swear. So how does 13 inches of wicked break compare to a soccer free kick? From the same distance as a baseball pitcher, can a soccer player bend a free kick over a foot? To find out, we head to the sports science AstroTurf pitch and bring in one of the best soccer players in the world, Olympic gold medalist, Abby Wambach. When it comes to putting the ball in the net, few players can match Abby. She has set scoring records in college, the pros, and at the World Cup. A lot of the mechanic and technique of actually bending a ball is having a lot to do with your your movement of your of your foot on the ball. With a bent shot, when you come up and you approach, you actually are sliding your foot in a direction and hitting it and following through in a way so that it creates a spin and trajectory so it'll actually spin. To find out if she can curve the ball as much as a pitcher, it's time to put Abby to the test. Can Abby bend the kick around the wall and into the goal? <laughs> that would have actually been a pretty decent shot on goal. So what curves more? Adam's pitch or Abby's kick? Adam's 78 mile an hour pitch spun at 26 revolutions per second and curved 13 inches. Abby launched the soccer ball at 64 miles an hour, spinning at eight revolutions per second. Abby's shot curved a total of 54 inches, 41 inches more than a baseball pitch from the same distance. That's well over three feet. So why does the soccer ball curve so much more than the baseball? To understand, we first have to understand the basics of flight. Our motion tracking technology breaks down the physics of a free kick. To make a ball curve, there are three variables a player can control. Launch angle, velocity, and spin rate. Once in flight, three forces take over. Gravity, drag or wind resistance, and what's called the Magnus effect. The clockwise spin means that the left side of the ball pushes against the air, creating high air pressure. The right side spins in the same direction as the air it's pushing through, so the air pressure is lower. So the ball takes the path of least resistance, curving toward the lower air pressure. 